Okay, well, a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, let's uh, give ourselves uh, maybe 30 seconds while we allow all the attendees to uh, join us online. Okay, maybe, maybe while we await the rest of the attendees to come on board, uh, I'll just uh, very briefly give a, a little bit of uh, an introduction uh, about APEC Med and a little bit about the webinar, and then I'll hand over to uh, Sabin, the moderator for, for today. Yep. Uh, Nishan, next slide, please. Thank you. Yep, so uh, a little bit about uh, APEC Med. Uh, APEC Med is short for the Asia Pacific Medical Technology Association. Uh, we are a not for profit medical technology association representing uh, companies operating in the medical device, diagnostics, and digital health space. Uh, basically, we lead efforts to advance medical technologies in order to raise the standards of care for patients. Um, yeah, next slide, Nishan. We, we are fundamentally a membership-based organization uh, set up by the industry. So there, there are two uh, segments of the membership I just want to highlight. Uh, one is the, uh, the left column, uh, which are the corporate members. And if you look at the, uh, the 20, uh, you look at the top 30 global medtech companies in the world, uh, 20 of them are already uh, members of uh, APEC Med. Uh, but the second category that I want to show you uh, are the startup and the SMEs. Uh, we have a growing number of startups and SMEs uh, accounting for more than 40% of our membership base. And uh, because of this growing segment, what we have done this year is that we have uh, introduced a program uh, called the Founder Series. And uh, today is one of the initiatives that is part of the Founder Series uh, program. Yep, so a very brief introduction about the, uh, the Founder Series. Uh, so this has been set up for uh, a few purposes. Uh, there, there's quite a lot of information uh, over there uh, in this slide, but I just want to highlight two key uh, reasons why we established this program. Uh, one is that we hope to help uh, you know, startups uh, scale up, uh, that's one. And secondly, what we hope to do is to be able to breach you know, startups with global companies uh, so that they can look at, uh, so that both parties can look at uh, potential areas uh, for collaborations and uh, partnerships. And uh, if you can see from the right over there, we have a series of uh, webinars that you know we have uh, conducted since April and uh, right up to the end of the year. And today is uh, one session or uh, as part of the entire founder series uh, webinar. So uh, with, with this, I am uh, delighted to uh, you know, share with you uh, today's uh, webinar uh, on uh, advancing uh, digital uh, oncology uh, during public health uh, crisis. So uh, a little bit of an introduction uh, to why this uh, session was crafted. Uh, one is, uh, I think increasingly, uh, evidence suggests that cancer patients have an elevated risk of COVID-19 infections and higher mortality rates. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated technology adoption in many different industries and the healthcare industry is no different. Uh, digital health and advanced cancer diagnostics plays a pivotal role by guiding precision medicine and facilitating patient care in the comfort of the patient's home. Uh, startups and SMEs, they are pushing the frontiers of uh, innovation, empowering patients with the right tool uh, in the digital age. So today we are really delighted to have you know, senior business leaders from uh, Guardian Health, from M Clinica, my dog, Wealthy Therapeutic, uh, to share how they are advancing cancer care in the e-patient era. So this session will be moderated by Sabin from Crescent uh, Strategy Consulting. Uh, I'll introduce uh, Sabin and then Sabin will introduce the rest of the moderator. So Sabin uh, is an executive with uh, 15 years of experience in the healthcare industry between corporate and innovation. Uh, Sabin's uh, expertise is focused in commercialization, new technologies to the market, scaling businesses through commercial, 
leadership and uh, developing effective go-to-market uh, launch strategy. So she has worked with uh, over 300 startups on their commercialization journey and is passionate about opportunities to push uh, innovation forward in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, I'll have uh, Sabin introduce the panelists for today. Over to you, Sabin. Uh, Sabin, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me? Uh, yep. Perfect. Thank you for the warm introduction, Gabe. I hope everyone's doing well during this time and looking forward to the panel discussion. So we're really excited to have four key founders with us uh, that are joining us on this discussion. And um, the founders are from M Clinica, Wealthy Therapeutics, Garden Health, and MyDoc. I'd like for each of the founders to do a short introduction of themselves and the background of their companies. That way we can see how they're all interconnected during this uh, digital um, therapeutic uh, conversation that we'll be having. So I'll start off with uh, Farouk from M Clinica. If you could start off by introducing yourself and the company, and then we'll move forward from there. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Good to be with you. Uh, so my name is Farouk Morali. Actually, my background's in pharmaceuticals. I used to work for Pfizer, Roche, Sanofi, and uh, Johnson Johnson. And, uh, and then came out to Southeast Asia more than now seven years ago. Uh, the problem that we're solving at Clinica is really looking at pharmacies, whether they are fragmented, independent mom and pop shop pharmacies or retail chain pharmacies or hospital pharmacies. Uh, there's a lack of digital connection amongst all these uh, pharmacies. So really what we do is we connect tens of thousands of pharmacies and about 150,000 pharmacy professionals together on a common platform. And specifically, one of the areas that we work on beyond issues in supply chain and general workforce awareness and, and education is on patient programs. Uh, so this is about how do you use pharmacies as a channel to provide discounts or free goods to patients who need financial assistance? How do you drive adherence and health education? And recently, we've started to do a lot of work in digital patient assistance for oncology, solving the problem of very high priced drugs we even have a program here in Singapore uh, where patients based on financial assistance can have a fully digital uh, patient program where they can receive a discount and get enrolled. So everything we do is around that and I'll, I'll spend time today talking about digital patient solutions and that digital journey. Thanks Sabine. Thank you so much. Um, Abhishek from Wealthy, I'll move it over to you to do a quick introduction of yourself and the company. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Abhishek. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Wealthy Therapeutics. So Wealthy is a digital therapeutic company that really drives um, an improvement in patient outcomes and, and, and the data and the quality of life and health economic related outcomes and everything in between. Uh, we started our journey in cardiometabolic. We expanded that to uh, respiratory conditions and oncology this year. Uh, and really what we focus on is how do we solve for unmet needs of um, of patients, physical, informational, psychological. Um, uh, and in that process, from the journey from diagnosis to remission and beyond, our focus is completely on uh, better outcomes, uh, better improvement in quality of life, reduction in symptom burden, and increase in adherence and doctor visits. And really in the process, uh, not just drive better outcomes for the, for the patient, but really help the entire healthcare continuum with better data and better clinical decision support. And as a result of which really help in improvement um, in the quality of care um, and the end goal that we're all seeking. And because we're completely digital, our entire footprint and our entire journeys of every one of our stakeholders is digital as well. And that's what I'm going to talk about over here. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Abhishek. Um, Samranjit from Garden Health, I'll turn this over to you to do your introduction. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Sabine. And thanks, APEC Matt, for the opportunity. Always good to be with friends. Um, so first and foremost, thank uh, th uh, my background, I guess. Um, been in the healthcare industry for over 15 years. I've uh, been uh, involved in uh, various uh, areas from consulting to then uh, part of a CRO to then part of a large conglomerate itself before starting um, Garden Health AMIA, which is a Garden Health Asia, Middle East and Africa. So I'm the CEO for, for this entity. Garden Health as a company is a precision oncology company. We basically have a proprietary liquid biopsy platform that helps to unlock 
uh, important genomic information for patients. We work across the cancer continuum, so for, from advanced cancer to recurrence monitoring for cancer survivors to early detection. Uh, we believe that by unlocking this important genomic information, we are able to get ahead of the disease and hopefully help to bend the mortality and the cost curse in cancer. Thank you very much, Sandranda. Um, and Vas, I'll turn this over to you with my doc to do your introduction, and then we'll move into the panel. Thank you. Um, so I'm Vas, one of the co-founders of uh, MyDoc. Uh, it's an eight-year-old uh, digital health company based in Singapore. Um, my background is that I'm a physician who trained in the, the UK and then uh, in Singapore. And uh, having uh, started a previous health tech startup in 2008 with uh, tele uh, radiology, I, I was really keen on the whole uh, experience of engaging consumers uh, uh, with uh, digital health in um, quite early on. Um, what I found or, uh, or in the in this journey is really that uh, although we were early, the the initial response from providers has uh, changed significantly since uh, when we started to now. Of course, COVID has helped a lot, but um, uh, the uh, acceptance of insurance and payers. Uh, in uh, digital health has changed quite a, a bit about the acceptance in the provider circle. So that's been interesting. And I can share a bit more about that as well today. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Very much appreciated. So we'll move into the panel discussion. This is going to be a very conversational and robust discussion. Uh, we've broken it down into three specific categories related to the advancement of digital oncology during this uh, public health crisis. So we'll break it down into the diagnostic, diagnostic treatment, and follow-up uh, pathway of the patient during this process. Um, so I'd like to walk through that patient journey and the shift that's happening between hospital to home care during each part of that journey. So what shifts are each of you currently seeing that's being implemented, and how are those shifts being uh, implemented? So perhaps maybe, um, Vas, maybe I'll start with you um, as a start, and then maybe we can go uh, move over to someone else. Sure. Um, I think the uh, question is a good one. Uh, it's about uh, transition uh, of care. Uh, when it comes to digital, the transition of care should be uh, a better experience than in a real world where you have a a written a referral form uh, or, or, or follow-up instruction that can be lost. Uh, here, the, the, the instruction should be clear from the hospital to the home care to the primary care. Uh, and this transition of care is a very uh, uh, important uh, aspect that grows with the patient because a patient health record gets built um, and you're able to empower the patient uh, for him to have knowledge about this, um, of what is uh, expected uh, for his follow-up care. So I think that's that's one thing that's important to get interoperability of data and getting that done. On the other side, uh, hospital to home care allows uh, more freedom when it comes to uh, providing um, uh, care for this patient from multiple uh, uh, providers, right? So they don't need to be in one organization. In a hospital, you're all in one organization and you're, 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 you're following that organization's, uh, 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 you know, uh, from billing to everything else. Um, whereas the, the challenges in the home environment is having multiple uh, providers and um, balancing that um, as a care team. The care team approach uh, is very important. And uh, today we have quite a lot of uh, home care agencies, nursing agencies. Uh, some of them are online, some of them are not. Uh, uh, it is, it is uh, still uh, early days, I think, uh, when it comes to home care. And, and uh, as hopefully uh, it is proven that it will reduce cost. As of today, uh, not many uh, home care plans are uh, sponsored or, or, or subsidized by uh, private insurers. And I hope to see uh, a lot more of that with more data and more validation from uh, the likes of us uh, working together and getting more data uh, to show that uh, it, you know 
uh, outcomes are better with uh, treatment at home. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Abhishek, I'd like to get your thoughts on this as well. And then I'd uh, be curious to ask uh, both of you two a specific question related to the accuracy of the diagnosis and um, how that's impacting some of these shifts. Sure. So it's really interesting, right? In these, in these times, uh, we're actually seeing um, a demand shift where you're for the first time seeing both healthcare professionals as well as uh, patients. Uh, moving more towards uh, uh, digital care to be able to manage uh, their their condition, which is fantastic. Um, but what you're not seeing is uh, in that process, as as Vas rightly pointed out, that how do you have interoperability of data? How do you ensure that the care continuum is not lost? I think that is a uh, a breaking point that hasn't been fixed um, in, in, in any condition, but especially relevant in oncology, right? So uh, that's really, really interesting to see because on what we're noticing is when you use digital platforms, you're actually able to get a ton more um, uh, real world data. You're able to get uh, EPRDs in a meaningful way, uh, but uh, fundamentally taking that, digesting that within the uh, healthcare ecosystem and making sense of it to be able to drive better clinical decisions is still still um, uh, not there, not to the extent that it needs to be. Uh, and therefore, uh, care is still suboptimal because it's breaking at different points in the journey. Um, and you know, better collaboration will help, but to the extent that it is at least able to be a really um, relevant uh, solution in this time is fantastic, right? So we're seeing whether it's patients or it's uh, their, their family members uh, drive more towards digital uh, both for a consult as well as for uh, better data mapping and better monitoring. So uh, tools are being used for uh, symptom tracking, emotion tracking, um, uh, weight management, better lifestyle you know, during, the, during the therapy. Uh, and then you still need to drive better adherence and get that data back to the physician so that they're able to make better clinical decisions. So uh, parts of the data streams are really active but the interoperability and the care continuum is still a gap uh, that needs to be fixed. But overall, um, there's, a, there's, there's more, to, more to play for digital uh, with a start point that has been uh, catalyzed because of COVID. Great. Um, does anyone else have anything they want to add to this before I uh, move into another part of this question? Yeah, so maybe, maybe I'll comment a little bit on this. I think in, in, and, and I think was sort of alluded to it as well. You know, we are in early days of home care. Um, and it's always important to start looking at it from a, from a cancer patient's perspective as well as the physician's perspective. And what are the pain points they are, they are facing and how digital can actually help, right? So if you think about a cancer patient, um, the, f the first thing that comes into mind for, for the cancer patient is, um, am I going to be able to get optimal therapy? What are the next steps do I need to do in order to, 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 to be able to get access to the right treatment. So first, the first part of their journey starts with understanding or coming up with knowledge or getting knowledge with regards to their cancer, their, their current condition, their indication, and what their options are available for them. Um, they also want to be able to get proper diagnosis as you have laid out in this, in this continuum. Um, they want to be able to, 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 to get their uh, appropriate information that will be able to help drive those decisions for treatment. From a, from a physician standpoint, it is about how do I manage the communication to this patient? How do I manage the ability to, 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 to provide guidance uh, for, for the patient to be able to access all the information that is available, be it uh, genomic information, be it uh, diagnostic information that I can use to, to make an optimal therapy decision for that patient. So all of those pieces um, in, in, in the traditional frame were de separate and uh, were, were, were done independently. Now with digital, you can probably combine some of that together. You can aggregate that information. You can be able to provide segments of that information or distill down that information that is bite size for the patient, uh, appropriate size for the, for the physician to make the right, right decision. Um, and I think that's what digital is helping to do. It's helping to be able to now make that continuum a little bit smoother and that transition smoother and that communication smoother. Has it gone to home care yet? Has it disrupted the entire continuum? I, I think it'll still take time, but, but we are in that journey and I think that's already occurring uh, for the patient and for the physician. 
Yeah, so there's a lot of interesting things that have been uh, brought up in the last two comments. Um, so related to the continuum of care and the tools that are available for the patients, as well as even like the uh, patient's um, support that they're receiving. For example, previously they are able to access a nurse right away at the hospital, and now they're going to be looking at uh, different tools and communities that are available to them. So looking into, um, so we're just going to segue a little bit into the next part. So then looking into these tools and these patient programs, um, obviously there's some HIPAA compliance that is going to be looked at in these things. So how are you, uh, how are you um, leveraging that, uh, the programs and making sure they're HIPAA compliant and being able to service the patients at a level that they need, especially in the oncology space? And uh, maybe Farouk, uh, maybe I'll put this off to you since you talked about some digital programs from your company as a start. Yeah, sure. So, so absolutely. So I think, you know, touching upon a, a couple of the fellow uh, panelists' comments, I think one of the aspects that we're seeing is really increase sort of digital in the physical journey. So just to take a step back, you know, I think there's been a lot of buzz around COVID-19 and increasing in telemedicine and e-prescription. But actually, if you look at visit volume, even now, uh, now that we're in this kind of new normal phase, if you will, uh, we've actually seen the consultations drop again. So they're slightly higher than pre-COVID, but it's not, you know, a hockey stick uh, sort of situation. So. I think things are a little bit returning to normal. And while there is this general trend to do e-consultation online, a lot of it isn't sticking, right? And so I, I think especially that's the case when you think about specialty care um, and, and you kind of look at, at that sort of segment. So where we do see a lot, as the fellow panelists have said, is that it is about digital assistance of the sort of offline world. How do you actually help these very complicated sort of therapeutic areas uh, that are targeting oncology actually be digitally assisted. So one of the ways that, that we actually address this is looking at the situation of very high uh, expensive, um, very difficult to afford uh, drugs that are often not covered, right? So you're talking about cancer drugs for, you know, breast cancer, renal cell carcinoma, so on and so forth, that are actually, you know, in the five, $6,000 a month range. And when you think about access, how do you actually make sure that patients, one, can actually fill their prescription, they can actually get on the drug, and two, they can stay on the drug. And that has implications in terms of creating sort of real world evidence, obviously in direct patient outcomes, but in terms of getting subsequent reimbursement and claims management. So the way we think about this is, one, how do you actually register patients fully digitally? So use the HCP, HCP who's a treating oncologist, to do the verification of the patient, get them enrolled digitally, do the financial assessment digitally. Then number two, how do you actually allow them and enable them to do their claim, right? So this is actually visiting a pharmacy, uh, actually being able to get uh, the subsidy or the discount or the free good, uh, whatever they are, are claimed for. And then three, you know, being able to actually manage that patient virtually, right? Send them health education messaging and literacy to keep them adherent. The result is better affordability, better access, better adherence, and generally a better and healthier patient. And the way this has to be constructed, per your point, Sabine, is really in terms of being very compliant. You know, safeguarding patient privacy. Obviously, this is a very sensitive issue, especially when you run these programs in Singapore. There are particular privacy laws in place. So ensuring that you have, one, full consent, two, you have data privacy and protection, uh, and, and three, you are able to actually run a platform that is end-to-end -end secure is incredibly important, right? And so I think that is table stakes. And if you've ever worked with pharmaceutical companies, you know that you will deal with every medical, regulatory, legal compliance before you can even get the green light to do one of these programs. So that is very, very critical to how you actually uh, build these digital programs and something we think a lot about. Yeah, Sabin, if, if you don't mind, uh, thanks, Farouk. You mentioned a little bit about uh, patient outcome. Uh, we actually have a question from Wishi, uh, and he's asking, uh, while there's a search in data and digital platforms, uh, how do you ensure the credibility of patient uh, reported outcomes, say, in, in the uh, oncology space, in the, in the cancer patient uh, space? How do we ensure the credibility of patient reported outcomes? So, so perhaps uh, another panelist can better answer the patient reported outcomes aspect. Uh, for us, I mean, we essentially are dealing with the adjudication right. 
discount and adherence and therefore don't really get into uh, patient identifiable outcomes for compliance reasons. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, we, we wouldn't be the best to answer that. Maybe, uh, Voss, I see your camera's on, so maybe go ahead. Um, yeah, so one of the benefits, I guess, what, uh, how we have structured it is um, having a primary care approach uh, allows our doctors or nurses to add clinical notes about these patients and um, the follow-up actions and uh, we can automate the patients to leave a note about their own experience as well as a feedback loop. Uh, that kind of allows us to uh, mine it, but um, again, the, uh, how, what is the uh, uh, authenticity? I, I guess it is as authentic as it would be with a normal primary care doctor talking to the patient or, or follow up. Um, I, I don't see any issues on authenticity uh, when it comes to reporting uh, with the providers on board. Um, if it's a real world situation, how would they report it? And uh, online, how would they report it? I guess uh, I don't see that as a very big challenge. Uh, of course, uh, th there are, uh, there are um, uh, people, I guess, more confident with the real world uh, than online. So uh, maybe not all groups are, are ready for it, like uh, maybe the elderly population or someone uh, who is a carer can, can be part of this uh, uh, feedback uh, loop as well. Um, so it may, it may come down to the demographics of the population in mind. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe to add, uh, since we run a bunch of patient support programs uh, uh, in Asia, um, you know, you have uh, biomarkers, digital biomarkers that come from connected devices that bring authenticity. Uh, and then you've got uh, the one-two verification step, Vas, as you mentioned, because I think uh, one question still remains that at the time of the consult, uh, whatever data is captured on the system, uh, there can be a level of authenticity as long as you have primary care attached to that consult. But what happens in the continuum of care when you have uh, patient uh, reported data and patient reported outcomes between two appointments, which is happening either uh, through a system, through an app, through uh, a chat support, whatever have you. Um, to be honest, the jury's still out. Uh, I think the, the data is overwhelming because the data exists. Um, some of that can be solved through connected devices uh, and, and other means. Uh, but, um, you know, if a patient is mentioning that he or she is, uh, has a symptom between two appointments and then systematically there is a scale attached to it, you can add a validated scale to bring a little bit more clarity. But can you really um, solve for authentic authenticity at the, uh, for 100% of the data? Um, probably not, um, to not to the level which would satisfy every physician. But to be honest, it's more data than there ever was before. So uh, the interesting bit is uh, you're seeing slowly but surely healthcare uh, rapidly adopt to all of these data streams, especially in patient support programs. Hmm. It's interesting. So related to the, um, the question that was presented with the credibility of the patient outcomes and the various approaches and how to validate this data. So there's obviously a, a shift in mentality that needs to happen from where the oncology patients uh, were going into the hospital and the clinics and having various tests done and having that in-person interaction and now moving into the digital space, obviously there's that shift in mentality from the provider as well as from the patient, um, from the payers, for example, from industry, from governments on how, how we can incorporate that and like what is uh, truly um, uh, able to identify like the right outcomes and not. So um, and it, like based on what we've just talked about, um, what other areas or gaps do you think we could fill or different um, stakeholders? So for example, government, for example, or corporates or industry or health systems could fill to help, uh, help with this uh, specific question on that credibility of the patient outcomes and um, in the digital space. So maybe maybe let me let me start off with this. Um, um, I think in terms of fundamentally, what are some of the gaps that we see? The first, in in especially in oncology, I think firstly is access to innovation. Um, the a lot of the cancer drugs, a lot of the cancer therapies treatments are very expensive, um, and that leads to the second challenge, which is affordability. 
the other part of it is that the pace of change is occurring really fast and you are seeing new disruptive technologies coming uh, online in, in especially in cancer care and cancer treatment and cancer diagnos diagnostics so there's a need to also then look at um, really fast and rapid changes in treatment guidelines and um, this requires a, a concerted ap approach or a um, uh, I, I would say a, a, co a collaborative approach between governments, um, oncologists, as well as uh, pharma companies, diagnostic companies, and medical device companies coming together. And so that there's there's need to, to 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 create those forums to be able to expedite access programs, um, affordability programs, to be able to look at how how the benefit of these new innovations can be. Uh, uh, available to a larger group of patients and then to be able to have a funnel for disruptive technologies to come in and come online much quicker. Um, and so all of that requires that collaboration. I mean, in, in our mind, I think at the crux of cancer, we believe that it's a, it's a genomic disease. And so in order to understand uh, the disease itself, you need to start looking at the, the, the drivers of the, of the disease, the genomic mutations that are driving. And that leads to, to, to better outcomes and better treatment outcomes. But in order to, 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 to get that, you need to have then shifts uh, that, and plug the gaps that firstly, there is an understanding that um, not all cancers are the same and that, that it's being driven by um, the, the genomic mutations itself. So comprehensive genomic profiling should be done for a patient. And maybe it's to a certain extent unethical now not to even do a, a, a genomic profiling for a patient because you have multiple therapies that are aligned to that particular genomic information. So that, that becomes a, a, an issue that the governments need to take up, right? Is this, is this uh, part of bioethics? Do we need to start looking at uh, access to that programs? Then you need to think about, okay, what are the, what are the technologies that are coming in play um, in, in, in terms of diagnostics or in treatments? Um, and is this gonna provide enough benefit for the patient? And so there's a cost benefit and a health economics uh, discussion that needs to be done and that needs to be fronted by the biopharma companies the diagnostics companies together with government and lastly I think ultimately I think relating to the earlier question it's about the patient is the patient feeling that they're, they're going to be benefiting from this is their quality of life if, if it's just an if it's an enhancement of that quality it might not be an overall survival but it might be progression free survival for some fine time in, uh, for, for that patient um, is that is that enough for that patient and patient advocacy groups need to come together to, to, to voice that that this this itself is a benefit for the patient and we need to look at driving newer innovation so that that would be how I would think the gaps can be plugged and what can be done in terms of a collaborative approach well thank you very much Samaranjit. Uh, does anyone else have anything to add to this question None of the panel members want to add anything else to that. Okay. Well, I'm curious, actually. So, like, you mentioned a lot of things in that uh, answer, Samaranja, and it was really well thought out. So, thank you very much. Uh, one of the things you had mentioned related to um, better planning for the future, in addition to the collaboration, was related to genomic profiling and capturing these data sets and a little bit earlier on than what maybe we are currently doing. So, obviously, that's um, a point that you see as um, something that is valuable to enable future innovation. I'm curious to hear from us what you see as valuable to help enable future innovation in the digital oncology space. And maybe, uh, maybe I'll go over to Abhishek at the moment because you're working in the chronic disease management section with digital, digital therapeutics. So, no, great question. Um, if I had to look at, um, you know, I'd step back from the data sets and talk about uh, what are the clinical outcomes or outcomes that we want to drive. Um, whether it's um, early stage patients where, um, as uh, my co-panelists already pointed out, right, it's about better outcomes, um, better improvement in quality of life, um, a reduction in symptom burden, or in palliative care where mental health uh, symptom management also matters, but also you know, beyond that is uh, in, in both how do you reduce risk and burden of hospitalization. Uh, the way I look any work that you do that ends up impacting those uh, outcomes or those metrics and HOER metrics and clinical metrics. And then you, 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 you sort of almost draw the line back to what are the markers that can help show that you're moving in that direction. Each and every one of those data points become important. 
but the way in which you want to uh, propagate that at the end of uh, your journey is to uh, focus on the same end goals that today uh, payers, providers, uh, and the larger healthcare stakeholders have already built out um, sort of decision on, right? They, they, people don't make decisions on the back of one individual data point. They look at how does the collective contribute to um, a, a known uh, endpoint that really matters, right? So whether it's an HOER endpoint or it's a, it's a clinical endpoint on the back of which I can change my treatment decisions. Uh, those are the ones that I would focus on and then drag that back to whatever are the, uh, the real world data, EPRDs, EPROs in the journey that really contribute to that. And as long as you can show strong correlations, each and every one of those data points start mattering. So that's the way we see it. That's the way we see healthcare stakeholders take decisions, uh, whether it's, uh, like I said, whether it's insurers or it's uh, providers and of, of course, pharma and device. Wow. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate that response. Do any of the other panel members have anything to add to that? Farouk, would you like to add something? Um. He's yeah, so so I mean, I, I think I think it's very well covered between uh, Simran and Abhishek. I think the other aspect in terms of creating body of data is really around increasing patient numbers in the RWE sense, in the real world outcome sense, right? So in order to actually generate data, you need patients who are actually on the therapy. And in order to do that, they need to be able to afford it. They need to actually be on it. Doctors need to prescribe it knowing the patient will actually get it uh, and, and be able to actually afford it. And then you're able to actually create the data. So a lot of how you know digital patient programs are are engineered is to create one enough patients that can actually uh, be on program to you know enough data that you can actually track, perhaps not in a patient identifiable way for compliance reasons, but in an aggregate uh, uh, way. And and then once you have that, you actually can marry that with clinical outcomes and actually make a, a great body of evidence for claims reimbursement and the like. But ultimately, if you don't have the patient population actually taking a new therapy or the like, you can't generate that body of evidence. And so I think when you think about affordability and access, um, you know, one of the levers beyond having obviously direct commercial impact to pharmaceuticals is that longer term commercial impact, which is, is reimbursement and claims, right? Uh, and generating the evidence to do so. I'll just add one more point. I think just just, uh, just to, to 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 look at it specifically in the in the in, in the cancer space and specifically here in Asia, I think there's also a need for us to understand that there is um, differences in uh, in uh, the Asian genotypes and the understanding of resistance mechanisms, the understanding for responders and non-responders. All of those data sets are important if you want to start looking at developing treatments and drugs that will benefit. The Asian population, and so that that is an important factor. I think majority of biopharma companies are now realizing that, and even the governments are realizing that, and regulators are realizing that, and they're pushing for for clinical studies and clinical evidence that are generated in the Asian cohorts separately, and so so that that will help to make the, the therapies also more effective. So so I think that's that's an important data set to be able to collate as well. Yeah, that's, that's very relevant. Um, we're definitely seeing an increase in um, industry being involved in uh, capturing different genome pools from around the world for cancer and uh, just uh, clinical trials in general. So I think that's a, that's a great point to make. Before I move into the next question, and, and thank you for that response. Before I move into the next question, does anyone in the audience um, have something that they want to ask? Or Gabe, did you want to ask something from the chat? Okay, we have a question from uh, Sona. I uh, say, hi, could you please speak to your individual strategies uh, to monetizing your product? Uh, what is the current situation and what is the ideal in your perspective? Great, so why don't we um, go through, we'll start with uh, Vast from my doc first and then um, go to Simranjit from Gardent and then I'll go down the list again. Right. Um, so the way we are looking at it is um, the wave has come and we got to ride the wave. Uh, what's proven to make money right now has been primary care. Um, and so we'll continue doing primary care as in as many countries in Southeast Asia as possible. Um, when it comes to collaborations, we were very keen on 
uh, specialist collaborations, uh, home care collaborations. Um, and so we're widening the, the way we provide care. Um, on top of that, I guess uh, the verticals uh, other than insurers uh, pay us. Uh, we're also looking at pharma, we're looking at uh, telcos. Um, there, are, there are more channels to reach the population than <clears throat> in a, especially in a, in a region where um, insurance penetration is still low uh, for health, health insurance. Uh, there needs to be better strategies to, to provide care online. Um, and, and so there are a lot of challenges between different countries. And uh, so we do, we do see the, the, the challenges and we are trying to overcome that with partnerships. So yeah, um, getting the right uh, ecosystem of partners is very important going forward, yeah. Thank you, Bas. Um, Samranjit with Gardent, uh, are you able to give some insight on to the monetizing? Sure. So, so I mean, I think we, we, are, we, are, we are in a very unique position, right? Because we are diagnostics and we are computing and we are bioinformatics all together. So we, we actually pose a very big problem to regulators to, to, to pigeonhole us into which regulatory pathway to, for, to, to get our, our products approved. Um, so in, in, in the U.S., there is a pathway, a pathway for next-generation sequencing, IVD. Um, in, uh, in, uh, in Japan, the pathway is a medical device software program. In rest of the rest of the, uh, the markets in, in Asia, it's a mix of both. Um, and then in China, there's, there's really no pathway at this point in time. Um, and so, 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 so we deal with that, that regulatory challenge first to educate edu uh, the regulators in terms of what are we and how do they care categorize us. We are not your IVD kit. We are not your lab developed test. Uh, we are not your computing software. We are a combination of all three. So, so, so how, 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 do, how do they actually um, help to, to, to be able to get the relative, uh, uh, the needed uh, clinical validation and clinical evidence for them to approve. So, so we work through that. Nonetheless, I mean, we, we have traditional uh, customer sets. We have the oncologists as well as the patients who pay uh, uh, direct for the tests. Um, uh, we have reimbursement, we have private as well as public reimbursement. We also work very, very closely with our biopharma partners. Um, and many of them require um, uh, the help of uh, diagnostics or advanced diagnostics like us so that they can be able to identify the patients that will be able to benefit from their, from, from their drugs. So in some of the instances, some of the, the biomarkers they are looking at is probably 1% of, of all uh, lung cancer patients, for example, how do you find that one that that one percent that is going to be able to to benefit from 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 that drug and have really good outcomes? So you need to be able to then look at how you screen um, to be able to find the right patient for the right right drug at the right time. And so that's basically the essence of precision oncology. And so so that's how we monetize and we we work towards bring our products to market as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, Simran. Uh, Abhishek from Alti, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, so we do a ton of work in uh, patient support programs. So that continues to be a known monetization channel. Um, and um, it's um, and and as we work a lot more with payers, uh, uh, both in, I mean in, in several markets now in Asia, uh, reimbursement is coming out as a clear winner. Where it's going back to how do you reduce risk of members? How do you improve the health of members? And because we're in the business of outcomes, we're not just in the business of data. Uh, we get that opportunity to be able to uh, drive risk reduction um, and better quality of life. And then as a result of which, by reducing the risk stratification, uh, drive better reimbursement. Uh, and needless to say that, um, you know, at the core, we're still a digital therapeutic company, uh, but reimbursement pathways for digital therapeutic uh, are more well established um, in, in uh, North America, uh, to an extent Japan, and to an extent a couple of markets in, in Europe, but it's still a long way away from really uh, becoming mainstream in Asia. So uh, as far as the Asia business is concerned, uh, uh, pure play digital therapeutic um, uh, based uh, uh, you know, uh, revenue streams are still some time away. Yeah, so it's, uh, Sabine, from our 
from our perspective, you know, we we very clearly uh, serve pharmaceutical companies. So we work with a lot of the, the biggest pharmaceutical companies across primary care, specialty, oncology, all of whom need to actually provide digital patients assistance programs. So these are companies that either don't have one and have issues in affordability or access or adherence, or do have ones that are traditional paper-based. Uh, and so we provide sort of a third party uh, uh, organization that actually runs and manages this, them along with the digital infrastructure end to end to do that. And so, you know, our clients would be, you know, all the big kind of pharmas that are running these programs across uh, Southeast Asia and now outside of Southeast Asia. Uh, so it's, it's pretty clear uh, kind of how, how we work with uh, pharma in that sense. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to touch on the patient programs and uh, the partnerships that uh, both uh, Abhishek and Farooq, you guys just uh, spoke about. Um, you're obviously able to fill some gaps that were happening in this uh, environment for the oncology patients, especially during this uh, public health crisis. So um, why, in your opinion, and this might be a provocative question, but in your opinion, why would some of the corporates have been behind in this space and you were able to fill those gaps? Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, I'll jump in on this one. So, so basically, you know, I think one, when you look at the price of oncology medicine, generally, it's, it's very high, right? And even if it's re reimbursed, some of the drugs are not fully reimbursed. And when you're talking about price, you know, let's say in Singapore, you're talking about four or $5,000 a month for, you know, out of pocket for, let's say, uh, met metastatic breast cancer, right? And so, how do you as a patient afford that? Even if you are middle to upper income, it's still very, very difficult. Uh, and I think, I think when, you, when you look at it that way, this becomes a real constraint. And as pharma companies think about access, in order to actually expand it, you need to be able to do things like differential pricing. How do you price based on financial assistance and means? How do you price based on an ability to kind of show oncologists that this is actually a good drug and get them to, you know, actually want to prescribe it. Oftentimes affordability is a barrier for the prescription in the first place. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that you actually need to think about on a commercial basis. But through these programs, you know, now patients are not spending $5,000 if they have financial needs or assessment, or even not. Some companies just say blanket provide a lower price. Now, simply through this infrastructure, they can get validated, they get a discount, they're paying half the price, you know, or, or even more sometimes. And it's an incredible kind of proposition for the pharma company. They show support to the patient population. They drive better outcomes. And there's certainly a commercial return for them. Otherwise, you know, they, they, they wouldn't necessarily do it in the long run. So I think that's really how you create alignment amongst all the different stakeholders. But fundamentally, a digital mechanism needed to exist to administer that. And that's really kind of the role that we play. And if I would add to that, I think Farouk, you 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 brilliantly captured from an uh, from an access and affordability perspective why it matters. Uh, if I had to step back, um, you know, pharma intrinsically cannot um, directly coordinate or touch the patient and and know the patient identifiable data, right? So you start from that handicap to begin with. But if you move beyond. Uh, pharma has begin, begun to realize um, that how important it is to empower the patient. Um, and that's just not something healthcare has been able to do as good a job of, right? So um, if you give patients tools, skills, uh, problem solving, um, teach them uh, the health behavior links, get, get them comfortable with self-reporting, give them access to an ecosystem of support um, that both peer as well as uh, from services and solutions, there's a lot more that you can give to an individual patient that can, um, get, that can drive better outcomes and better quality of life for their journey, uh, none of which uh, traditional healthcare provides, and all of which matters in the in the goal of keeping that patient adherent to adherent to treatment, uh, and thereby drive better outcomes at scale. Uh, so I think the combination of not being able to do that directly for the patient, and then you know actually seeing that all of this actually drives value back, I think is the one-two combination that I'm I would add to what Farooq already rightly pointed out in oncology. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, Gabe, I see that there's uh, some questions in the chat box. Do you want to turn to those before I ask the panelists the final question for the round? Yep, sure. Okay, so we, we have a question for uh, Simran. 
what were the challenges that were faced in bringing novel diagnostics like genom genomic testing into traditional healthcare uh, from a regulatory perspective, payer perspective, etc.? Yeah, so I, I, I think I alluded to some of the, the challenges. I think a lot of it is um, the, the lack of understanding um, and it's about education and awareness, right? So first, first and foremost, we needed to, to, to start engaging the KOLs, the, the oncologists, to, to understand how the technology works, for them to be comfortable to be able to use it in their clinical setting and to be able to use it for the benefit of the patients uh, in terms of to derive clinical utility. So a lot of, a lot of our focus has been in, in that evidence generation. I mean, I think we've done a tremendous amount of uh, uh, groundwork in that space. We've got almost 200 odd peer reviewed journals, uh, uh, articles that have been published uh, and clinical studies that have been done, uh, more than 56 or, or clinical utility studies that have been done. So all of that provides the, the body of evidence that is required uh, to, to engage the KOLs, for them to be comfortable to start speaking about this technology, and more importantly, to see how it can disrupt and be able to, to, to improve clinical outcomes for them. So once that's done, then the next step was to, to work with the regulators to, to furnish that information that, hey, we've got all this body of evidence, we have all these clinical studies, we have all, all these KOLs that are already using it in their clinical practice and benefiting the patient. And so that then, then helps them to come up with guidance because they you know regulators have to put it in a pathway right they, they, they can't make these spoke pathways for you um and, and be able to to, to prove move forward your products so then they need to then start thinking about it oh wow um this is going to be a, a disruptive type of technologies can we think outside of the box so that's exactly how japan thought about it and they said you know there's no way we're going to be able to govern What's, what goes, out, goes in the front end of the technology in terms of the diagnostics itself, whether it's an IVD or whether it's lab developed test, let's just look at the, 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 the key part of the technology, which is the bioinformatics software. And let's just approve the medical device software and be able to then look at the evidence that's been generated up front and approve that software to get access to patients as quickly as possible. So other, other governments and other regulators are also thinking about that and they're trying to see how do we uh, uh, get comfortable with uh, the, 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 the technologies and the pathways so that we can have more companies also availing to the pathways and being able to bring new technologies into the market, but also not be uh, 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 lax or, or, or less stringent so that um, the, the, the quality is impacted or the patient uh, outcomes are impacted. So I, I guess they, they, they look at uh, a balance on doing that. Um, in terms of the, the, other, the other major aspect of bringing new technologies into the market is really reimbursement. So you can get the approval, um, but is there a pathway to, towards reimbursement? And I think that's, that's another area where diagnostic companies really uh, have to engage much more with private as well as public payers. You need to, under, you need to let them know what's the burden of disease um, what are you in, uh, able to impact with better diagnostics? You're going to have better clinical outcomes. You're not, waste, you're not wasting resources on treatments that are really expensive, but do not benefit the patient or might in fact even harm the patient. So, so all of those clinical outcomes and clinical health economics or health economics uh, data needs to be generated and put together. So, so it's a combination of education. It's a combination of clinical evidence and health economics coming together to be able to bring the products through the pathway. Okay, thank you very much. It, um, there, there's a lot in that response. I, I feel like there, it's uh, quite connected to some of the past parts of the conversation that we've already had with uh, the collaboration with all the different stakeholders that we need to have the uh, data sets and the innovation that we need. Um, I'm going to move into uh, the last question for the panel. And it, it's a personal question actually for each of the panel members. And, it's related to this uh, entire public health crisis. I'm curious to know, what has been the most satisfying point of achievement during the last six months for each of you, either personally or professionally? And uh, perhaps, um, Bas, maybe I'll start with you and then uh, work through the list again. Um, yeah, I think uh, it is really pretty unprecedented, but um, the growth in terms of volumes initially uh, was significant. But it has been sustained for primary care. Um, it it's continues to be something that um, corporates uh, as well as insurers are seeing as a must-have. So uh, learning, learning uh, from 
from our, over the years of experience and trying to do it all uh, in a very short period of time um, has kept me personally sleepless and, uh, and getting into new markets, uh, like uh, suddenly uh, into new countries um, uh, and setting up the platform as with, with partners locally. Um, we have added three countries in the last three months. Um, so like it, it is, uh, it is, it has been interesting. At the same time, um, the responsibility I think uh, has to be there that uh, we we are we are uh, we should uh, uh, show some uh, good practices that um, uh, keeps medicine safe online, uh, and the regulators will only be able to catch up. They can't uh, beat us to it. So, uh, you know, like uh, we, we may have to uh, guide them, help them, as Simran was mentioning, uh, and, uh, and uh, work with the uh, different uh, stakeholders. Uh, I think pharma are a lot more engaged than they used to be. Uh, I haven't uh, seen this level of engagement. Like we are also getting a lot of inbound uh, requests and, 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 and figuring out how to work with Pharma. So uh, we have done a few projects, but I think we will expand on that. Um, but uh, yeah, th it's been an interesting uh, few months for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. What about Simran? What's been um, your biggest sense of achievement, personally or professionally, over the last six months? Yeah. No. no I, I think there's been lots of learning during this this really really difficult period. I mean, um, for us, we we I mean the the, the fundamental point here is uh, pandemic or no pandemic can cancer patients require treatments and and so so for us that was our, our, our main prerogative right when we when we looked at we were serving the needs of the patients and we needed to be able to work through all the barriers um, there are and I think the team um, at, at garden went way above beyond their call of duty to be able to do that I mean I I, I can't I can't I, I can give you so many examples I mean one of them uh, that occurred was um, in uh, in uh, in India, for example, uh, the lockdown was 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 called really really uh, abruptly, and so there was no no lead time to prepare for it. Um, and you had patients who had already done their blood draws, um, and their and their samples were stuck, and no logistics players could be able to go in to get them. And you had people from my team going all the way, driving uh, six to eight hours to to the different. Uh, uh, centers to be able to collect the blood samples to be able to ship it directly to the to 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 um, the uh, the logistics players to that they can they can send the sample out to the lab. I mean th those those were uh, beyond the call of duty for us. Uh, we had we had uh, the, uh, establishment very early on of mobile phlebotomy services so that we can prevent the risk of cross infections for patients. Ma many of cancer patients are already immunosuppressed. And you do, they, 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 they are finding it um, really risky and they, and they were thinking twice to go into the, into the, into the hospital for, for diagnostics um, and time to treatment for them is really important. And so we, we then started mobile phlebotomy services to be able to, to do blood draws um, at their homes or in a mobile clinic. And, and those were only facilitated through our channel partners and the team. So I, I think that that's the biggest, biggest learning and biggest um, uh, sort of highlights for me from the pandemic of how my team and 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 the way the the cancer patients itself uh, were able to 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 fight the the, the pandemic and a public health crisis. That hey, you know, we, we're not going to let this stop us. We're going to be able to still work together um, to to try and do the best in the situation. Um, and also the physicians, right? Many of them putting their their lives at risk to be front and and front line to be still caring of the patients and coming into the the hospitals, they could easily have closed their specialist clinics, but they did not. And so all of those things, I think, have, have been highlights for me. Thank you very much, Simran. Uh, Abhishek, uh, what about you? Uh, it's, just, it's just been an incredible uh, two quarters, right? Um, I think first, if I had to step back before I even talk about Wellbe and talk about an ecosystem, right? Um, this is the first time in the history of, well, ever, uh, that um, the digital health ecosystem has been asked to step up to the challenge uh, to solve for the, the gap the pandemic has caused. And I think collectively as an ecosystem, what we've been able to do, uh, startups, associations, uh, conglomerates together has been incredible. 
Uh, so I think that I think is the first proud moment for, you know, not so much just as a company, but more as an industry that the digital health ecosystem did um, take that challenge up and has been able to do a ton of work across uh, so many different aspects of healthcare. Uh, and that's super proud of as an entire um, sort of ecosystem to be to to stand up and, and take a bow. Um, and that continues to go on, right? Um, personally, uh, or rather um, uh, for, for Wealthy, the company, I think during this time to see, um, uh, a, you know, patients lean in even more, um, you know, engage more, uh, look to digital health more than they've already looked to. Um, uh, and, and not just uh, sort of uh, be curious about it, but, you know, go all in and say, hey, uh, I demand that, uh, you know, digital health solves for uh, my, my, my primary care and, and to an extent some of secondary care needs as well. And uh, that's just phenomenal to see. And, and you know, patient engagement has gone up, patient um, um, sort of satisfaction has gone up, uh, patient outcomes have improved during this uh, time when they've not had access to uh, physical primary care. And a lot of our conditions and patient support programs, which is just incredible to see. Um, so I'd say that uh, has been and super. And then just, I think from a, uh, from a from a from a larger um, um, I guess uh, uh, health of company perspective, uh, to be able to uh, find that uh, our enterprise partners are even more keen to be able to work with digital health now, and are able to do the one thing which I didn't think that they'd be able to do, which is uh, you know end to end close deals uh, completely digitally without physical meetings. Uh, <laughs> that uh, that that's that's something in healthcare that I thought it would take some time but it's incredible to see that it's happening and it's happening really, really quick. So these have been some of the personal highlights. Thank you very much. And yes, a lot of uh, deals are being closed over Zoom these days. Um, and Farouk with M Clinica, uh, last but not least, uh, what about you? What have been your highlights personally or professionally in the last six months? Yeah, so I think we were actually very directly uh, involved in COVID-19. So, you know, I've mostly discussed our digital patient programs, but, uh, we actually do a lot of direct in pharmacy programs. So this is, you know, pharmacy education, pharmacy engagement, uh, data gathering from the pharmacy channel. Uh, and, you know, we, we connect about, a, you know, 170,000 pharmacists and pharmacy assistants and owners and managers, all the pharmacy workforce uh, across, you know, 40,000 or so pharmacies across Southeast Asia. So when COVID-19 hit, um, you know, ministries of health, you know, the Ministry of Health of Indonesia, Ministry of Health of, uh, or the Department of Health of the Philippines, Ministry of Health of Cambodia, Thailand, they all reached out and said, what do we do on the pharmacy channel? And what was really interesting is what we were seeing is that, you know, as patient volume started to go a little bit down at the hospital and clinic, patient volume to the pharmacy went up, right? And I think patient fear of generally in the markets that we operate in, of entering the hospital clinic, potentially contracting COVID-19 unnecessarily, uh, also practices were shut, the pharmacy became uh, much more uh, in terms of its ability to serve. Uh, and so, you know, we quickly responded um, with the government to basically do massive education campaigns to pharmacy professionals to understand symptoms of COVID-19, to counsel patients, uh, even to, to collect data in terms of how many fever meds were actually being procured, which can be a proxy measure, for example. Uh, and so, so that was very interesting to be directly uh, you know, called upon to basically help on the COVID-19 response. And personally, you know, I'm from a public health background. So I think that's, that was quite a exciting personal time for me to actually be able to use digital infrastructure to solve a very pressing pandemic. Uh, so I think that was quite exciting. Yeah, that, that, that's great. Thank you so much, Farouk. Um, well, we are over time for the panel, so I want to take a moment to thank um, APAC Med for putting this panel together and thank the panel members for your robust discussion and willingness to participate in this to educate the rest of us um, on the webinar uh, in the space of digital oncology during this public health crisis. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Gabe, I'll turn this back over to you to finalize it out. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sardin, and, and the uh, entire panelists for today's uh, webinar. I, I think in, uh, just in closing, uh, you know, clearly, you know, digital oncology uh, will differ in the future for both uh, patients and you know, uh, physicians as uh, discussed today. I think a few key takeaways, I think for the, for the patient, uh, I think uh, at home uh, diagnosis is uh, something that will uh, definitely happen. You know, the ease of uh, access to remote yet uh, quality healthcare 
uh, enabled by improving technology and better internet infrastructure will definitely be one of the highlights uh, in, in oncology, uh, I feel. Uh, the second thing about uh, the impact on uh, patients, uh, one of the key takeaways is also uh, tailor-made uh, cancer uh, treatment uh, with each patient getting a tailor-made product just for them. Uh, I think this is quite clear as well because mutations are random and if you look at one uh, patient's tumor and compare it to another patient's, it would be uh, highly unlikely that uh, they, will, uh, they will match. And specifically for uh, physicians, uh, I think two key takeaways. Uh, I think one, uh, one is in addition to uh, telemed uh, telemedical uh, consultations and follow-up, uh, I think oncologists will have more uh, reliable devices and uh, techno technology at their disposal to assist them uh, in their task. And the second thing about uh, for physicians is that, you know, I feel maybe AI-based medical uh, decision support uh, will also have a central role uh, in the future of uh, oncology. So these are some uh, takeaways uh, from today's you know, uh, panelists, and I just want to thank all of you for uh, being with us today. Uh, meanwhile, uh, keep well and stay safe. Take care, everyone. Super. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. everyone. Take yeah. care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.